Now this is a unique, unique country. There is no nation on planet Earth that came back to life after 2,000 years of not being in its land. Almost every other Israeli is somehow related to either the Holocaust or to the, the unique and miraculous return of the Jews back to their land. We're in the most violent neighborhood on planet Earth. We're in the most unpredicted neighborhood on planet Earth. We're in the most religious neighborhood on planet Earth. When now we celebrate 70 years, we, we celebrate it and we call it the miracle that is called Israel. It, it is a miracle. My testimony starts with me being born to a Jewish family. I ended up finding myself without a family when my parents got a divorce. I grew up in foster care. At the time, I looked back in my life and it, it, I really saw no hope. I decided that uh, I should put an end to my life. was about to do it. Then I felt that something is telling me that I may have not given the world enough chances. I decided to give the world one last chance. And that week, my friend's family, they're all holding hands, closing their eyes. And the father says, well, let's pray. And and they ended up the prayer with a very interesting thing. They said, B'Shem Yeshua in the name of Jesus. And I was like very, very, very shocked. Because for me, to hear such a thing uh, was hard. Why do you pray in the name of Jesus? Is God not enough? We are Jewish people. We believe in the God of Israel. I was told, why don't you ask God to show you who Jesus is? And I remember I wrote on a piece of paper, God, you know, please show me who Jesus is. The next day I go to work, I put together the newspapers in a big one page size advertising in that newspaper, Yeshua. The name of Jesus in Hebrew, in the proper name of Jesus, not the curse. It was the Jesus film of Campus Crusade showing in Jerusalem. It was filmed in Israel, it's a Hebrew language, Israeli actors, and I'm watching all the prophecies that I know being fulfilled before my very eyes. I was amazed. A virgin shall conceive by sin, chapter 7. A, a child will be given unto us. Micah, chapter 5, the story of the New Testament given to the people of Israel. Jeremiah 31, the suffering of the Messiah for the sake of our own sins in Isaiah 53. I mean, it's almost like the, all the pieces of the puzzle came together for me. And I knew then and there that I have to make up my mind. Because I remember, you know, just a few weeks ago, I was about to end my life. And now, I, for the, I know why I'm not done. I remember that night, I literally prayed and I asked him to be not just the Messiah, but it would be my personal one. I got baptized not far from here, and uh, I joined the Israeli army. I ended up being the deputy governor of Jericho in the Jordan Valley, and I was the official guide of the Israeli government for all the delegations that came to tour the Jericho area and the preparation of the handover of Jericho to the Palestinians. I don't know how many people got to see God in action, protecting their nation during the war, the way I did right here. Today, we see a nation that has the zeal but not knowledge. They have the zeal, but the knowledge of the Messiah is missing. The good news is that there is hope. Paul said it's the hope of Israel is not the peace process. The hope of Israel is not their government or their military or their land. The hope of Israel is Jesus. You want peace? He's the Prince of Peace.
You want a king, he's the king of kings. You want a shepherd, he's a great shepherd. Jesus is the only hope of Israel, the only hope for the Jewish people. Thank you. Welcome, Amir Sarfati, for the first time to Abundant Life. We hope it won't be your last time. No. We are so glad you're here. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. So Amir is working on a sermon that he's uh, not prepared to preach yet, but we're going to kind of talk about some of that. Israel, what's next? This is kind of how the next hour is going to go. We're going to have uh, just a conversation up here with Amir and I. Then we're gonna have a chance for you to ask questions. There's mics here. We'll let you know when that time comes. If you have a question, you're just burning to ask Amir, you've wanted to for years, now is your chance. Just be respectful of everybody else here. They might have a question too. And then uh, Amir has graciously um, agreed to have a book signing tonight. And so we will finish up with that for the evening. But I promise that uh, he's got to fly back a long, long ways tomorrow. So we're going to be out of here by 9, okay? So wherever you are in line at 9, you'll have to come back next time. Okay. In 2025. <laughs> in 2025. So Amir, October the 7th, a day that's uh, forever changed not just the nation of Israel, but the world. Tell us about October the 7th, because a lot of people, they think they know, but they don't know what Israel is up against and why they are absolutely, completely committed now to the destruction of Hamas. Why is it so important that Hamas be stopped? So, um, as you know, Israel is back in the land since the late 1800s, and the state of Israel was born, as Isaiah 66 predicted, um, within a matter of hours, we had to decide whether to declare statehood or not when the Brits told us that they're leaving. Can a nation be born at once, Isaiah asked, and of course, it, it was. <clears throat> but from the very beginning, we knew that we have a, an issue um, with the enemy. The enemy that hates God and cannot fight God, and therefore it comes against the people of God. And um, so, don't be mistaken, but in 1929, we were already massacred in Hebron before Israel was a state. And we were massacred by the same people that are now trying to kill us again. And no one talks about that. But we are talking about an ongoing attempt to stop the plan of God, to bring the people of God back to the land of God, to fulfill the plan of God. And that's what we are witnessing. And, and unfortunately, I must say, Many of the Jewish people in the land of Israel grew complacent and um, the country is doing very well, obviously throughout the 90s and 2000 and Israel economy is just skyrocketing. We're from a country that was on the verge of annihilation in 1948 until 1967 is now one of the major powers in the world. A lot of people decided that it's our time to be part of the world. And to be part of the world meant for many of us to stay away from that which makes us different. We want to be accepted, so we run away from that which makes us different. It's something, by the way, that God warned us from day one, and it's something that even Balaam, when he wanted to curse and found himself blessing, he said, 
From far away I see a nation not reckoning itself among all the others. But I want you to know that Israel was torn before October 7. So many people hated their Jewish identity, hated their Jewish background and Jewish, um, I guess, uh, who they are and what we're doing here. We began to apologize for being here, just like it happened to you guys now. I mean, I see so many similarities between what's going on in Israel and what America is going through right now. Wokeism, liberalism, progressive mind, uh, mindset took over. The day before October 7th, the Supreme Court was to deli deliberate and to, de to decide whether Jews can pray in the streets of Tel Aviv. Can you imagine? That's how torn and divided we were. And then came October 7th, 6, it was actually 4.30 in the morning when <clears throat> we already detected some very, very unusual movements. Apparently for months, the soldiers along the border warned and said and talked and screamed and tried to get their commanders to do something. But when it got to the top brass of the military intelligence, it stopped right there. It stopped right there because many of the top brass military generals were involved to their neck with politics and were not happy with Netanyahu. And so it stopped right there because it stopped right there. And it's interesting because that night... All the signs were there, and yet the order was not given to the forces on the ground to get ready. The conception was that Hamas is deterred, that what we are watching is probably another exercise, military exercise, which they've been conducting for the last few months. To be honest, even the Hamas terrorists thought that it's an exercise, and only an hour before they were told, no, this time is for real. So very few people in the very top command of Hamas knew today we're doing it. The rest thought maybe it's another exercise. And what happened at 629, a heavy barrage of rockets, mortar shells, along with Drones that drop bombs, snipers that hit um, the, um, all the cameras along the border. And we basically blinded the Israeli, they blinded the Israeli military from even seeing what's happening along the border. Simultaneously, on top of Toyota pickups, on top of motorcycles and four by fours, they managed to breach 15 places along the fence. And the first thing they did, they slaughtered the military presence along the border that they could. And then they approached their prize, civilians. They came ready and armed to kill as many as possible in the most sadistic, barbaric way possible. The amount of weapons and explosives and RPGs and um, my, I mean, the amount of weapon they had with them was enough to kill at least 100,000 people. And the maps we found in their bags showed that they had a plan to invade way deeper, to take over two strategic military air bases, to kill all the pilots and to destroy all of the uh, aircrafts on the ground. And more so, I will say, now I, I can say it, 
I, I couldn't say it until a week ago, they had plans to take over some strategic military installations that had some other types of weapon. That if I told you, I'll, I'll have to kill you. <laughs> the worst part, you see, I have no problem when a war is between soldiers and soldiers, is between armed people and armed people. But the worst part happened when local Palestinians that worked in the Jewish communities along the border led other civilians that came in the second wave to a celebration of looting, raping, beheading, burning, and chopping to pieces people whom they knew. People who helped them, gave them work, gave them food. People who rallied for them. People who drove them to hospitals within Israel. People who were on the left side of the Israeli map, on the ones that was the most pro-Palestinian you can find. These are the first to be slaughtered in ways that I, I, I don't want to defile your souls right now. But we had to assemble bodies because we, find, we found piles of heads and piles of legs and piles of hands. In some cases, we had to call in for archaeologists because the fire consumed the body to the point that there is no DNA. We need to now identify them by their teeth and their jewelry. In a case of a girl, 25-year-old from a neighboring town where I live, she was part of the music festival. Um, for seven weeks, we didn't know where she is at. And, and you have to understand, hundreds of people were slaughtered in a very small area where the participants of that festival were. Rape was not occasional, it was systematic. From investigations that we did as we interrogated all those whom we captured alive, there was a commander just for the rape. They actually not only premeditated, prepared it, but they appointed someone just for that. You would think that you know what rape is. No, you don't. Because we found women in complete splits position. Their pelvises, their legs, their ribs, Everything was broken. And those animals would continue to rape them until, and then until they pulled their gun and shot them in the head and then continued raping a dead body, which is completely broken to pieces. We found not one, not two, dozens of bodies like that, even of males. Male genitalia was cut off, and we found dozens of them everywhere. They were sadistic. So when we find bodies five hours or two days later, we think he's dead. What we now know is that there were three hours of torture. Because only now the survivors begin to talk. Many of them attempted suicide. Some of them were forcibly admitted to mental hospitals because they completely lost it. Because we, you, they witnessed the most horrific atrocities mankind could ever see. In kibbutzim along the border, there are kibbutz is a type of community where children have their own homes, where somebody is taking care of them. That was the best thing that ever happened to those savages because they took all the children and burned them alive, piling them up.
a pregnant woman was captured. They opened her body, pulled the baby, and stabbed and killed the baby while still connected with the umbilical cord. We have never seen things like that in the Holocaust. We haven't seen even ISIS performing things like that. What was done was done in ways and fashion and manner and that shocked the Israelis. So we are a post-trauma nation right now. For us, there is a monster that wants to kill us. And this, the, the, the choice is simple. Either it kills us or we kill it. There's no other option. What we do now is deal with the monster. But I will tell you, I could see the hand of God in three different aspects. Six months ago, seven months ago, I, I wrote an article where I quoted sources that said that the grand plan of the Iranian regime is to have Israel destroyed by activating all their prox proxies simultaneously from Syrian, Iraq, from Lebanon, from Gaza, from the West Bank, and from Yemen. And actually now, when we are inside Gaza and we find Hamas outposts, we found all those plans. That's exactly the plan. That was the plan. But Hamas jumped the gun too early with the hope that he will inspire everyone else to join they just didn't understand that that's not what the Iranian wanted. The Iranians were angry, shocked that Hamas did that to them. All their work to surprise Israel and to destroy it at once went down the drains. Because now we're going to destroy Hamas, we're going to push Hezbollah far away, and we are at the highest alert, and we already know their plan. That's a miracle. Another miracle that I see is that the Israelis woke up from this illusion that someone on the other side wants to live next to us in peace. We woke up to understand what they're now openly chanting that from the river to the sea, they do not want to see me. You understand? We woke up to understand that there is no one to talk to and nothing to talk about. There is no chance for a two-state solution. The Palestinian Authority is more of the same. And we woke up from that, that progressive mindset that we even need to apologize for being where God is the one who brought us into. And the last thing, the last thing I will say is that we see a major exodus of Jews from secular life, from hedonism and materialism towards belief in God. And everyone who goes into Gaza well, not now, all they know is Judaism. For them, this is how I can practice my faith in God. And not a single soldier, even though he comes from the most secular background, would now want to enter into Gaza and fight without having his phylactra and yarmulke and prayer shawl. And, and all we hear now, I don't know if you're following me on Telegram, but listen... I posted this morning a group of infantry soldiers that right before they entered, they went together 
hugged each other and sang, I believe in the coming of the Messiah. That's what they sang. I choose to look at this, the good things, but I am so angry, so sad, so enraged, not from what they did to us, that, that's a given, but from how the world is now reacting. And yeah, you probably yeah. So I want to show it. a video. A lot of you have probably seen this. Amir has had this on his socials. This is a congressional hearing of three chancellors or presidents of some of our most elite institutions of higher learning, campuses where students have been chanting Infanta, genocide to the Jews, and. Uh, and these chancellors are now ask, answering questions, why? Why are we allowing this on our campuses? I want to show this, and I want to get Amir's response to this, because we need to know how to talk about this. Our kids are being confronted with a worldview. Uh, our kids are being confronted with a distortion of the truth. Uh, our kids, in many cases, are motivated by the right things. They want to take up the cause of the oppressed or those that they see are victims, and we need to learn what the truth is and how to have a genuine, intelligent conversation with those that disagree with us. But it is time for the church to engage in the conversation. And so I wanna show this, and then I wanna hear Amir's response to what we hear and see here. At MIT, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate MIT's code of conduct or rules regarding bullying and harassment, yes or no? If targeted at individuals not making public statements. Yes or no? Calling for the genocide of Jews does have, not constitute bullying and harassment? I have not heard calling for the genocide for Jews on our campus. But you've heard chants for intifada. I've heard chants, which can be Semitic depending on the context, when calling for the elimination of the Jewish people. So those would not be according to the MIT's code of conduct or rules? That would be um, investigated of, as harassment if pervasive and severe. Ms. McGill, at Penn, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct? Yes or no? If the speech turns into conduct, it can be harassment, yes. I am asking, specifically calling for the genocide of Jews, does that constitute bullying or harassment? If it is directed and severe or pervasive, it is harassment. So the answer is yes. It is a context-dependent decision, Congresswoman. It's a context-dependent decision. That's your testimony today. Calling for the genocide of Jews is depending upon the context. That is not bullying or harassment. This is the easiest question to answer yes, Ms. McGill. So is your if testimony it, that it, you will not answer yes? If it uh, is, if the, yes speech or becomes, no. if the speech becomes conduct, it can be harassment, yes. Conduct meaning committing the act of genocide? The speech is not harassment? This is unacceptable, Ms. McGill. I'm gonna give you one more opportunity for the world to see your answer. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's code of conduct when it comes to bullying and harassment? Yes or no? It can be harassment. The answer is yes. And Dr. Gay, at Harvard, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment, yes or no? It can be, depending on the context. What's the context? Targeted as an individual, targeted as, at an individual. It's targeted at Jewish that. students, Jewish individuals. Do you understand your testimony is dehumanizing them? Do you understand that dehumanization is part of antisemitism? I will ask you one more time. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment? Yes or no? 
anti-Semitic rhetoric when it and crosses is it anti-Semitic rhetoric? Anti-Semitic rhetoric when it crosses into conduct that amounts to bullying, harassment, intimidation. That is actionable conduct, and we do take action. So the answer is yes. That calling for the genocide of Jews violates Harvard Code of Conduct. Correct. Again. It depends on the context. It does not depend on the context. The answer is yes, and this is why you should resign. These are unacceptable answers across the board. What is our civilization coming to? So I have some thoughts I'd love to share, but you haven't heard, you know, you're not here because you want to hear mine. I know, I know, I know. You haven't driven hundreds of miles, to, I, I know. Amir, how do you respond first when you hear this? And, and how do you think you should instruct Christians to engage in this conversation with intelligence and information, not emotion, but, but with facts? Well, the Bible tells us that if we hate any group of people, the Spirit of God is not in us. And we need to understand that if you come against the people of God, you're coming against the apple of God's eyes. But I will tell you, what you just saw demonstrates to you the fruit of progressive mind, mindset. If, ye, if, if that congresswoman would have asked about LGBTQ, or about Africans, or about um, uh, uh, Arabs, or about others, the answer would be very, very quickly, yes. What we see here is continuation of the attempt of the, and, and by the way, make no mistake, if you look at this only with eyes of a human without understanding the spiritual angle of it. This is a spiritual attack. Only the enemy wants people to not count a genocide of Jews as something that has to be immediately eradicated. Only the enemy wants the Jewish people to be completely wiped out and you will only look at it depends on the context. You have to understand this type of, and these are the leaders of those institutions. The Ivy League universities, that's their death right now. What you just saw, I don't think, I don't think anyone would consider them uh, in, in the future. Because that is the type of something that no parent would like his child to adopt. But I will tell you, that this is not something new. This is what you see now is the manifestation of that which has been worked on and, and diligently um, uh, pumped into the, 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 the hearts and the minds of so many people throughout the last 20 or 30 years. This is now, now we see who is the teacher who is the uh, president of the institution and why it makes sense now that the students of these institutions can easily walk in the streets and say from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And when you ask them, what river? Oh. <laughs> what sea? Oh. They chant for intifada and you ask them, what is an intifada? Oh. They don't think anymore because the world is not interested in people thinking anymore. And when we have the word of truth, when we have the word of God, when we have the spirit of God in us, that's when we understand. That's the only way to fight this. But I will tell you th this thing, and I see that. The Jewish population in America that has been traditionally very liberal, very progressive, smells the coffee and wakes up right now.
Because now they understand that being progressive and being liberal and being woke and being cool and being generous and being always rooting for the, 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 you know, the, the ones that we think is oppressed, no one looks at them now and no one counts that any, as any virtue. The Jews are being hated for being Jews. Not for their political stand, not for their progressive mindset, not for their world view, just for who they are. And when they understand that, they realize everything we fought for, donated money for, voted for, believed maybe even, everything is actually falling apart. Because these people, when the moment came and allowed that demon to come out, all of them turn against me right now. And by the way, why is it that the American Jews are being attacked right now when the atrocities are actually happen, happens in Israel? Because it's not about Israel. It's, not a, it's about you being a Jew. That's the problem. In the past, they were very, very, very smart to say, I'm against Israel, but I love the Jews. They don't even say that anymore. Now they realize that Israel is fighting because they came to kill us because we are Jews. And now they finally realize, wait a minute, when hundreds of Jewish women are being raped and killed, not a single women organization rises up and condemns it. They realize the united nothing is saying nothing because they are united nothing. They realize all those organizations they were always in support of are now silent. If you I, have a question, you can start making your way to one of the mics right now. Uh, I actually just read an article by a professor at Columbia University, one of the most liberal left-leaning universities in our nation, New York, and it was a Jewish professor saying this very thing, calling out their liberal friends, their liberal colleagues, because they felt abandoned by them. It's exactly what you were talking about. And the simple truth is, guys, look, um, people don't even know how modern nations are born. You hear all the time this illegal occupation, that uh, this is an illegal uh, nation. You need to remind people, when you hear these things, Israel was reborn as a nation, not because the IDF rolled into Palestine and just took over. They were voted on by the UN in 1948. They were affirmed by a majority of the UN chartered nations at the time. This is how modern nations are born. Uh, seven years later, the UN can't just undecide what had decided seven years earlier. You understand that, right? So when you hear these sayings, just people completely speaking without knowledge, we need to correct the distortion. This is not an illegal occupation. They were legally chartered as a nation. This is how nations are born. If you want to talk about who's occupying who, it just so happens the third most holy site in all of Islam is occupying the most holy site in all of Judaism. So who's occupying who? And if you really want to talk about who was there first, but you see in the end, facts don't matter. When you have a worldview and a religion of Marxism that has taken over, where people view the world now and they are taught exclusively through victims, victimizers. If you have any sort of power, economically, militarily, politically, you're clearly the bully of the area and will choose whoever's against you. And if you want a ceasefire, we had one on October 6th. Yeah. We did not break it. And, and let's not forget there are over 130 people that are still kidnapped and held under the ground and are being, and the reason why 
there is a group of at least 12 to 16 young girls that is not being released is because they know exactly what these women are going to say about what happened to them. And so they don't release them. There are Israelis that were captured on October 7th and they were taken as captives and they were held in homes of United Nations workers, of doctors. They were held in, in under the ground. They were, they were abused and tortured. They were starved. Some of the Asians that were there from, from the Philippines, they ate toilet paper that they, they had to put water on. They, that's what they ate. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want this war to end, surrender and give us our kidnapped people, and it will end. We're, we do not want war. But you cannot just slaughter 1,400 people, kidnap 250 people, and think that the world can go on. No nation on planet Earth would have gone as normal. And I will tell you as Christians, because some Christians criticize me for not having enough love and compassion for the other side. Let me tell you something. First of all, Romans chapter 13 says that the government has the duty to exercise vengeance on the evildoers. Not the right to do it, the duty to do it. My government, I'm not going there and shooting Palestinians. No, I have a military and I have a government that has the duty, according to the Bible, to do that. And if they want the war to be over, give me all the people you, had, you kidnapped and surrender all of those who killed all these people. That's it. The war will end at once. Okay, first question. Uh, my question is, um, after Moses died and Joseph, I mean, uh, Joshua led the children of Israel across the river and God told jo uh, Joshua to destroy the cities, destroy all the inhabitants of the land and purge it of all the foreigners. That didn't completely happen. Do we see that coming about again today? And will modern Israel learn from the lessons of Joshua? Well, first of all, I would like to, in, 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 well, I would say recommend a book for all of you to read. And it's called From Time Immemorial, written by Joan Peters. And the reason is, I know you cannot get a hold of it. We can send you a free copy by, because we found a way to download it for free. Never mind. It's actually illegal what I just said, but I'm taking my words back right now. But I will tell you, I mean, it's out there on the internet. But I will tell you this. Most of those Arabs that we see today that call themselves Palestinians are work immigrants that came most of them came after the Jews began to return back to the land. We know that from archives of the Ottoman Empire, of the United Nations, on the British, on the British mandate. So it's not even a, a question. We know what happened. You have to understand that the, the Arabs did not call themselves Palestinians. They don't even have that word in the Quran, and they don't even have that letter P in their language. They never called themselves Palestinians in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. The reason why is because they called themselves Arabs. <laughs> it's the Jews who called themselves Palestinians until 1948. The Jews had a Palestinian passport. The Palestine Post is the Jerusalem Post. The Palestinian Brigade was the Jewish Brigade in the, in the British uh, military during World War II. We called ourselves Palestinians because some sort of a mentally uh, disturbed uh, Roman uh, emperor decided to uh, punish the Jewish people and name the land after their Old Testament foes, the Philistines. Even the name Palestine has to do with Israeli, the Jewish history in the Bible 
They're nothing to do with Arabs. And who were the Philistines? People from the Greek Isles. They were not Arabs. And what is the meaning of the word Palestinian? It means the invader. I mean, if you call yourself Palestinian, you're actually admitting that you are the invader. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that when the Jews finally were able to declare statehood and change the name back to the God-given name Israel, that's when the Arabs adopted the name Palestinians. Because if they kept the name Arabs, that would have obviously pointed the fact that they're from Arabia. They're Arabs. But they had to not be Arabs. Now they had to somehow belong to this part of the land. So they changed the narrative. Do you know that in the 1920s, the Muslim authorities issued a booklet that describes the Temple Mount and they wrote that the Dome of the Rock stands on top of where the Temple of Solomon was. Guess what? Today, they say it never happened. They say that there was never a temple there. Today, why? Because it does not serve the narrative that they created over the last 70 years. The flag of the Palestinians was not even invented until when? 1964. Israel was already, what, 16 years uh, independent. There was no Palestinian flag. And I... If you want to see what the Palestinian flag, Palestine, the flag of Palestine in 1930s, you'll find out that it had a Star of David. <laughs> Listen to me. It's all, the only thing the Palestinians invented is the fact that they were a nation. You understand? There is no innovation. There is no, nothing besides inventing history that never existed and then telling the whole world that they're the victims. This is not similar to the, to the Moses, to, to the uh, Joshua entrance to the land because in the time of Joshua, the seven nations, the Hittites, the Gergesites, Jebusites, Termites, all of those, <laughs> they were practicing such evil conduct and practices that God said leave no one alive. Remember, and the standard is now the standard of the people of God, the word of God in the land of God, okay? He said, that's why he said, this is different. We did not enter into a land. Mark Twain said in the, in, in the 1800s, he said, not even a, I did not even see in the entire journey a single living soul, he said. The land was underpopulated. It's the Jewish return that brought so much to the land. And I will conclude with this. In 1917, it was the Balfour Declaration. In 1919, Jews signed peace agreement with Arabs. Did you know that? There was a peace agreement between the leader of the Muslim that was the custodian of the holy sites in Mecca and Medina. The Sharif of Mecca, his son, Abdallah, signed a deal with Hein Weizmann. They had a deal. And the Muslims in that peace deal said, we acknowledge that this land belongs to the people of Israel. We encourage the Jews to return back to their land, but we implore the Jews to help us in our efforts to build our Arab land in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq, and in Arabia. And the only reason why we don't have peace is because the Arab leader was smart enough to say, I'm going to sign it pending on the British Empire giving us what they promised us, namely Iraq in Lebanon and Syria and the Brits did not and so that peace agreement in which the Arabs acknowledge that Israel belonged to us is no longer valid so it's different and uh, I hope my answers will not be that long to every question <laughs> otherwise we're until tomorrow here sorry yeah it shouldn't be lost I on know. the world either the Abraham Accords 
was actually bringing peace yeah. to places in the Middle East it had never come. And it just so happened, yeah. I mean, the timing is obvious. For anybody paying attention, Hamas doesn't want peace. That's the worst thing that could happen. It's for Israel's enemies, including Saudi Arabia, to sign a peace accord with Israel. Iran knew exactly what they were doing, knowing they could completely disrupt the Abraham peace accords by an attack like this. And so, if anybody paying attention, look, you cannot make peace with a people whose only win is your complete annihilation, your complete destruction. It's in writing, it was chartered in 1988 for anybody paying attention. A two-state solution is not what they want. They want the complete destruction of the Jewish people. You can't make peace with people like that. For everybody in your life saying, peace, peace, why aren't you calling on Israel to have Listen, there was peace, October the 6th, and there would have been more peace with more nations signing the Abraham Accords. They broke the peace for a reason. Next question. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you, Amir, for your ministry, and thank you, for Pastor, for this church. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Bef before I ask you the question, um, I just want to point out this lovely couple sitting behind me. This man turns 100 years old in January, and he fought for the freedom of the Jews and Americans and this world in World War II. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Am I invited to your birthday? No. Okay. All right. Okay, so it's a quick question. All right. Do you think that the weapons that you're finding now um, in the tunnels and all over Gaza, could this be the beginning of the seven-year burning of weapons? No. That was quick. But I'll tell you why. Wait. <laughs> Go back. <laughs> the seven-year burning belonged to Ezekiel War. Okay. The Ezekiel War hasn't happened yet right. for, for, for very obvious reasons. The, in the Ezekiel War, no country will help Israel. And in the Ezekiel War, it is a war that is led by Rush, Russia, assisted by Iran and Turkey, Libya and Sudan. It's a specific war which I believe is the next war, and I believe we are seeing now the events that will expedite that war. But what you are referring to is the outcome of that war. So we're not there yet. So are and we at the Isaiah 17 war? Isaiah 17, I believe, is the little thing that will ignite the whole region to bring about Ezekiel war. Isaiah 17, for those of you who don't know, speaks of the utter destruction of Damascus to the point that it can be no longer inhabitable. And as you know, Damascus has never been destroyed to that point. Okay. And, and so it's a future event and it will happen. And if you are readers and if you love to read fiction, the last fiction thriller out of the far north deals with that. Oh, wow. okay. And just before you sit, the next thriller, we just sit a couple days ago to work on it. And I am very angry with Erdogan because everything we talked about and it's the main ch chunk of the plot of the next book, Erdogan just said the next day. <laughs> So I don't understand, but I will tell you, Damascus will be destroyed, Israel probably will be blamed, Russia, Iran, Turkey, and then Libya and Sudan also will come against us, and guess who is going to protest that invasion? Saudi Arabia, Sheba and Didan, yeah. the lions of Tarshish, which is Europe, Western Europe, and the young uh, 
the merchants of Tarshish and the young lions. The young lions, some suggest, could be America. We don't know. One thing for sure, America is not going to help us. No. America no. will not help us in the Ezekiel war. And the question is, why? Because we're not here. And my prayer is that America will be paralyzed due to the rapture of the church. Next question. Well, you don't have anybody who's going to criticize you here. You're among a lot of friends, and we're, it's an honor to get to meet you and ask you a question. I've got two quick questions, one after the other. Prime Minister Netanyahu just, just told in a news conference that more than likely Israel will have a military presence after they wipe out Hamas in Gaza. Yet in 2005, Israel withdrew their military presence from Gaza. Two years later, Hamas takes over. Hamas slaughters Palestinian authority. They make everybody know the statement of faith, kill every Jew, and 58% of the Palestinians voted for Hamas. Correct. So my questions are, why do you think Israel withdrew in 2005 the military presence, and then why isn't the world paying attention to this nonsense about pro-Palestine when they voted for Hamas? <clears throat> so first of all, Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2005 because Prime Minister then Ariel Sharon was, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in trouble and he needed to um, have the legislative, uh, not the legislative, the, um, the um, Attorney General and uh, the, um, um, the, um, uh, the whole legal system in Israel, which is very, very dangerous. That's why we need uh, reform, okay? Um, he didn't want them to prosecute him. So they kind of hinted to him that if he wants to um, not be touched, he better dance to the music of the progressive liberals and thus withdraw from Gaza and even from the West Bank. And he began by evacuating three settlements from the northern part of Samaria. It was the way the progressive liberal controlled um, 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 legal system in Israel threatened a sitting prime minister. And that's what happened. And this is exactly why we need a reform. Because that's the last fortress of the progressive liberals. And uh, because Israel is a state of law, when the Supreme Court rules, we have to obey. Well, the Supreme Court in Israel is controlled by progressive liberals and is not allowing anyone that is different in his opinions to be part of their ranks. Israel is the only country where they have veto on who gets in. And so, so look at how this whole... Judicial reform now is needed when a problem in the judicial system causes a prime minister to act like that in order to save himself. And that's why we withdrew in 2005. And by the way, make no mistake, 75% of the Palestinians in the West Bank supports us. And, and the October 7th events. And there, in the West Bank, West Bank is the heart of Israel, the mountains of Israel. Can you imagine if they do the same? So I'm saying these things happen, and why is the world with them? Because the world is the world. That's it. When was the last time the world was on Israel's side? Never. We're used to be blamed by the world. 85% of the resolutions of the United Nations are against Israel. When horrible things happen around the world, they're obsessed with us. That tells you that it's a spiritual thing. But yeah. Amir, Amir, when, when the Palestinians would vote Hamas in, though, that's what I can't understand. Why would they vote them in knowing that Hamas would be just as brutal to Palestinians as they are to Jews? For that, I will answer 
the way Golda Meir answered. And she said, peace will come to the Middle East when Palestinian mothers will love their children more than they hate the Jews. Yeah, my son just sent me a text. This seems significant in some way. What do you think? It pays to be the pastor's son. What can I say? He sent me a text. UN steps up Gaza ceasefire calls with strongest moves since 1971. Breaking news. He invokes the strongest tool he has at his disposal to call for a ceasefire now in the Gaza Strip. It can only be defined as something spiritual. Absolutely. It is satanic. Mm -hmm. It makes no sense any other way. Yeah. Anyone who wants a ceasefire now wants Hamas alive. It's, that's the, that, because that's the immediate thing. And of course, the irony is the people calling for the ceasefire and these kids protesting on college campuses, these are the same people that would slit their throat and rape their wives and put their babies and bake them alive in ovens if they could. They would do it to them too, if they could. They're cheering for the very people, if they could, would do the very thing here that they did October 7th in Israel. Next question. Shalom, shalom, Amir. Shalom. I'm so happy to be here. I follow you on Telegram. I'm very interested because I have a daughter in Jerusalem now for the next 10 months, so I'm quite keen to know. I also follow Jen Markell, a friend of yours, Olive Tree Ministries. And she had something I'd like you to, to address, and that is there is a Islamic Judiciary Council that she posted that put out a fatwa on Hamas. I posted it. You posted that. I must have confused yours with Jen's. But could you please speak to that? Because this is very, very interesting yeah. to me. Thank you. Well, um, some Muslims understand that Hamas only brings sorrow, pain, misery, and destruction and is misrepresenting Islam and the Islamic, um, uh, I would say, set of, 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 of uh, uh, morals. Um, and make no mistake, I need you to understand something. Most of the Arab countries in the world wants to see Hamas destroyed. This is why you hear nothing from Saudi and nothing from the UAE and nothing from Bahrain and even the Egyptians tolerate this and the Jordan. Everyone understands that Hamas, if Hamas is winning here, they are next. They will be toppled as well because Hamas is Islamic Brotherhood. Islamic Brotherhood is outlawed in every Arab country. The only place in the Middle East where it's not outlawed is where? Israel, no, Palestine is not a state, so it's not a nation even. But you have to understand, and the only place in the greater area is Turkey, because Turkey is ruled by the Muslim Brotherhood, Erdogan is one of them. But you have to understand, they are posing an existential threat on the regimes all across the Middle East. So that fatwa from the, um, that organization, which by the way, I, I think I, I posted that as a story in, on Instagram because it was a video that was made. Um, and, um, and again, you have to understand, uh, Hamas is, is being praised by so many people here uh, that are chanting in the streets so many terrible things. Yeah. Success to the IDF. Correct. And I, I, but, but we have to understand, folks, the Arab countries around us can't wait for us to finish with Hamas. And as we speak right now, as we speak, the Egyptians are building a third fence so God forbid the Palestinians will not move to their territory. That tells you what they think about them. I mean, think about it. When the, when the Syrians had refugees because of the Syrian uh, uh, civil war, 
Turkey opened its gates, the Europe opened its gates. When Ukraine had a war, even Israel, one of 16 countries that opened its gates. Who opened the gates now? No one. Why? Ask that. We've got time for one more, and then we're going to have to let him get to a book signing. It's this time, over here, this turn. Um, so I watched uh, some previous videos of yours a long time ago talking about the Antichrist in Europe, and you're well aware of the secret societies that pretty much run the entire Earth. And I'm asking this out of humility because I don't know, and it's really hard to tell what's going on at all when you're not there. But um, I've heard on the internet that Israel did not react to the invasion for around six hours. And my question is, is that true? And if it is, how, like, how did that It's happen? not true. Okay. It's not true. In fact, Itai, where are you? Stand up, please. This is Itai, my friend from Israel. He was called up. And three hours after, he was already in this military unit. It's a lie to say that Israel wanted this thing to happen. It's a lie that is echoed by conspiracy theorists. And stay away from that. It's the same people that will tell you that there were no planes that hit the Twin Towers. When I know that, I know people who saw it. I know people. I was there. Listen to me. We have enough things that we need to, you know, do in this world. And the last thing you want to do is look ridiculous in the eyes of the world when you are echoing stuff like that. Israel was surprised on October 7th. We had a colossal failure of the top brass of our intelligence. Everyone knows that from the least of the soldiers to the top of the government of, of uh, 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 government uh, ministers. We were in that concept. The government thought that the military said Hamas is deterred. The military said Hamas is deterred because the military didn't listen to the soldiers who said, hey, they're about to do something. So yes, there was a knowledge, but the knowledge was not taken seriously by the commanders. So no one was interested in this, and certainly not our government, and certainly this is all conspiracy. They say that we need to have a pipe through Gaza, and that's why we wanted Gaza to be destroyed. What pipe? What are you talking about? We have enough pipes. <laughs> the only pipe I know of, the pipes that we're now getting the seawater into their tunnels, not the only pipes. Guys, I'm sorry. It's uh, 8.30. I know you have questions. We do not have time for one more. We need to be respectful of Amir's time. Don't you agree? So I know a lot of you want a book signing. He will come back. Can we can say 2025 maybe? 2025, yes. Okay. Uh, Amir if will come if back. you're in Israel in 2024, visit us at uh, our Connect in the new center we're building. Do you think we can go in 2024? Maybe in the latter part. Okay. No, One we more. don't have time. He's I want to pray for Amir right now, and then we're going to let him get out there to the book table. And if you see him walking, let's let him get all the way there before you stop him, okay? Jesus, thank you for Amir tonight. God, we're so thankful that you brought him here. Jesus, I pray blessing over him. I pray, God, your gracious hand would go with him. The Lord, you protect him as he travels. The Lord, you would use him in exponential, indescribable, but undeniable ways in the days ahead. That, Lord, you would use his ministry to go out around the world in even greater ways. That the spirit of truth would be upon him. That the truth would prevail in this day of deception and distortion. That, Jesus, you would show your majesty, your glory, your power, Lord, to the Jewish people and beyond. Jesus, we know that we're living in prophetic times. God, we thank you that you have placed us here for such a time as this. Lord, I pray the body of Christ would stand up, speak up. Lord, as the body of Christ uh, would not cower in the face of a cancel culture, but Lord, you would fill us with the power and the presence of the living God that it would be upon us. I pray the light of the gospel would shine bright 
in these days. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you give it up for Amir? Amen. Thank you, Amir.